Welcome to co combustion's video on the short procs where we include the sulfur and the heating value. Coal Combustion Incorporated out of Versailles, Kentucky. I'm Rod Hatt and I've worked in the power, the coal, the laboratory industry and now I operate coal combustion in hopes that you can learn more about and understand the business of coal. We're still on the proximate analysis but we're including today's discussion the short prox which includes the sulfur and the heating value. So that's what we've got today. We've dropped out the volatile and the fixed carbon and we're looking at moisture and ash, the dilutants, and the sulfur and the heating value or the higher heating value HHV. We can call that the calorific value too. It's usually reported in the BTUs per pound but other units would include kilocalories per kilogram or megajoule per kilogram. Um, the others are reported in a percent. Now we're going to use BTUs per pound uh, for our units basically because I live in America but keep in mind that a BTU is not uh, the same as a kilocalorie. It's a little bit less and what we're really doing is in this test is looking at the percent moisture, the total moisture, and the percent ash and then what's the heating value of the volatile and fixed carbon. Now keep in mind that these samples are coming from mines and mines look like this so even though the analysis are reported accurately there's always some plus or minus associated with that. Now the first thing you've got to do is go get a sample so the sampling is one of the more important things in determining it and one of the things we want to do is look at not only do you get that sample but when you get back from the laboratory you get all these different reported basis as received or the stuff with the total moisture is the most important but there's also as determined dry basis and moisture ash free uh, analyses sometimes reported with these laboratory analyses. Now keep in mind we got to go get a sample before it even gets to the lab. So going after the cold sample it can be hard work and you have to have integrity and trust in the people that are doing the sampling work. Now it's not usually hand sampled anymore. We usually take a mechanical sample but keep in mind that all mechanical samplers generally have a crusher in them and crushing the rise out the sample. So coals that are suspect high moisture, wet or low rank high moisture coals all suffer from this crushing and the potential of drying the sample which of course gives a lower moisture and higher heating value or higher BTU value in the sample reported from the lab. Now uh, when we prepare the sample for the lab not only do we uh, uh, crush it but we might actually have to go about drying it and uh, uh, getting it uh, down to this uh, bag of uh, coal so hopefully it's not been dried because what we're going to do in the lab is first air dry it. So we put it in an oven about 10 or 15 degrees C above ambient and we force the wet or surface moistures off that coal primarily so we can pulverize it. Keep in mind that these standards were all developed for high rank coals which are more oily and really don't contain that much surface moisture and they don't even have that much moisture uh, inherent or in the bed moisture or the equilibrium moisture so bituminous coals are low moisture but those subbituminous and low rank coals can be much more like a sponge this is a lignite that I've let dried out in the office here just in my, my uh, temperature and now I'm dripping water onto it and you can see that it starts off on the surface but gets sucked into it like this sponge like or what the heck is the outside or surface moisture of this coal very hard to determine as a result when we look at the weight loss over time in the drying process the high rank coals or the bituminous coals tend to reach a constant weight that's what the standard says you should do the other ones keep losing weight so you have to just stop at some time that you feel works for you once you get that surface moisture off you can pulverize the coal and prepare the laboratory sample. The laboratory sample is a 60 mesh minus or a very fine powder of coal. We'll be weighing out about one gram of this material but this is the laboratory sample that we've got to get to. So now when we go about weighing we would like to have the coal not be too wet or dry so that we can weigh very accurately the amount of coal that we're putting into the calorimeter or the sulfur machine, whichever analysis we're going to do. Now, one gram's not a lot, that's what the sampling and all that's about. Now, 
if we just say, okay, we did a good job there, we got to keep in mind that as received or the total moisture samples, the one we want to do, because that's the weight that represents the coal that we weigh. And so when you do commercial transactions or try to c calculate a heat rate or anything where you're weighing the coal, we want to use the as uh, uh, received basis as the best way to go about calculating that. These other basis like the as determined basis or the dry basis are useful for doing some calculations, but generally we want to go after the uh, as received. The moisture ash free is without the dilutants at all. This should be a relatively consistent number for a given coal seam or gold mine. Now, if I've got to just use a BTU per pound, assume that it's in the as received for format. So if I give you an example and just call it 8500 BTUs, that's definitely in the as received format because those other formats or basis really don't apply. If I'm looking at coals of the same rank, I don't have to do the net calorific calculation, so that'll be covered in another video. So now, what's the cost in, in terms of BTUs, dollars per million BTUs? And so I'm going to use that laboratory HHV, and I'm going to actually calculate the dollars per million BTU. It's been around for a long time. Here's 1924, here's 1919, various articles where people are saying, you've got to calculate dollars per million BTU and boy doesn't that ten dollar coal at 12,600 BTU look good but that's the actual cost of the fuel so these are important numbers if I do it in modern terms here let's say I pay forty dollars for 8,500 BTU coal I've got a 500 factor in there to get rid of the uh, tons and the uh, uh, per million BTUs but there it is. And so now I have a bit way to compare different cost of coals at different BTUs uh, guaranteed. And I can look at the price of the energy for these fuels instead of just the price per ton because the calorific value is important. With the short prox, I also get the sulfur. I can measure the percent sulfur in the coal. And that combined with the higher heating value allows me to calculate SO2 emissions. So I can actually go about and look at what the uncontrolled SO2 emissions for various coals. And you can see that in pounds of SO2 per million, those numbers could be different between different coals. And you might want to consider evaluating that price. We can do the same thing for ash, the amount of fly ash and bottom ash, wear and tear, or even slagging issues are sometimes correlated to the amount of ash in a coal. And so we can look at the ash in terms of the boiler by looking at pounds of ash per million BTUs. So again, I have a way to evaluate different percent uh, ashes or different percent uh, um, BTUs without actually having to, uh, 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 or I can look at it in terms of the boiler. So hopefully you have a nice day and uh, these uh, little bit of calculations or information can help you. Coal Combustion Inc. out of Lex or Versailles uh, near Lexington, Kentucky. And of course, we have a great website with lots of articles about these same things. Uh, thanks and good luck. You take care. Bye bye.